Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon, Focus Compounding, the number one value investor podcast in the world. How's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How is it going with you? It's going great. So this is our third episode we're recording today. I got a blue shirt on right now and I have, yeah. can't see it. I got blue pants. So I got a full on blue fit. Blue fit. Going okay. On. <laughs> right. Full up loofah going on. This is the first time you're watching us on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up. If you are listening on the podcast side of things, a rating and review goes a very long way. So we haven't done a super investor series or episode in a very long time. Right. Um, and you wanted to talk about Philip Fisher today. Mm -hmm. And Buffett has long said that he's a big fan of Philip Fisher. And actually on his book, which we're looking at right now, Common Stocks, Uncommon uncommon profits what does he say he says i am an eager reader of whatever phil has to say and i recommend him to you he actually went out and visited him if you remember from uh here it says i sought out phil fisher after reading his common stocks on common profits when i met him i was as impressed by him as by his ideas a thorough understanding of the business obtained by using phil's techniques enables one to make intelligent investment commitments and i was shocked by how many things in here that i think of as buffett things are taken from fisher really yeah, yeah. and buffett has said that he's X percentage gram and X percentage. Yeah, Phil. about but 40, 50 years ago, he said 85% gram, 15% Fisher. Yeah, so there you go. And what do you think it is more so today, though? I don't know. It's interesting reading about it. Some of the things he has are very Phil Fisher, but some are not. Um, so like he's mid, as I think I am in this respect, he's about midway between Graham and Fisher in terms of how you analyze a business. He cares, uh, Phil Fisher does not, did not care much about reading the annual report in the 10K and stuff. Buffett does and takes a lot from that. Um, Buffett focuses on different industries than Fisher. Buffett didn't quite pay the prices that Fisher did, but uh, some of his things about holding things long term, about the importance of management, about a few other things are incredibly 100% Fisher, 0% Graham on those few points. So a lot of stuff that you can't get from the filing, sort of these intangible qualities? Yes, but Fisher did a lot of scuttlebutt learning about it in person, that sort of thing. Buffett does a lot more um, reading of general background stuff and um, taking more out of certain documents and stuff, I think, than other people would. He's even said that sort of where he said he used to do a lot of scuttlebutt. But then if you do a lot of scuttlebutt and you have experience in those things, you sort of are able to do it more without talking to management and stuff. And it's interesting. He's invested in lots of things where he hasn't talked to management. Fisher never did that. What are some things that, I guess, Phil F Philip Fisher did that you have taken away and that you think is intelligent for everybody to add to their process? So Phil Fisher was pretty close to a coffee can portfolio sort of investor. We've talked about that before. Yeah. Buying a stock and keeping it forever. He bought some other things too, but generally that was the kind of thing he did. The big ones that you can think of that I can think of from him are he bought things like Dow Chemical, Texas Instruments, Motorola, a couple other ones. I think Raychem was a big one for him, stuff like that. And um, through the 50s to the 70s was his most productive period. And he held them for the long term. Um, and he was very big on evaluating management. In mm -hmm. fact, Buffett's thoughts about management and Fisher's are incredibly close, even though Buffett focused on different industries. <clears throat> and that part actually is the biggest one. It's sort of the way to think about stocks and, um, and then the, the way to think about management and the importance of management. Those were two really big ones for, uh, for him and for Buffett both. Um, the other thing that I found fascinating about Fisher is I was reading him right after reading Graham. And there's some things about Fisher and Graham that are incredibly similar. And really interesting that way. The biggest ones is them talking historically about the stock market, like about stocks and how far out of line um, stocks can get from the underlying business fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So like almost the concept of Mr. Market is kind of shared by Fisher and Graham both mm -hmm. to an extent that's really impressive. Both of them, Graham and Fisher, do not believe or care or anything about the idea that the market could tell you anything at all. Like they believe in independently figuring out what something's worth and the market will sometimes be right about that and sometimes have bizarre moments where it values entire industries, companies, whatever, through manias and things like that. And it really stands out compared to modern things I read, both Fisher and Graham's approaches to those and the historical things. So like Graham does a big thing in The Intelligent Investor. I forget if it's in every edition, but it's in the 1970s edition where he goes through a history of the A&P company and the prices that it sold at. And it was basically a net net when it was probably the biggest retailer in the world. Hmm. 
right? And it'd been successful. It was a successful period for it. A few decades later, it has lost a ton of ground to other retailers, and yet it's trading at a very high price for a retailer. So, and, and Fisher talks about that too. Like, well, I was just reading here an interesting one where he told his clients, Texas Instruments was one of his favorite companies, and he told his clients, you know, uh, it had risen 15 times in seven years from when he had bought it. And he told clients that uh, you shouldn't consider this uh, in calculating your net worth, don't use the current price because it's way overpriced. Mm-hmm. It dropped 80% while he held it. And a few years later, it was double that, again, uh, double its previous high. So it wasn't a big problem. But he sat through that kind of decline and was fine with it. He was fine that he had told clients ahead of time mm-hmm. that it was overpriced. And then he kept it through the decline and stuff, which reminds me of almost no one except maybe Buffett who could say Coke and Gillette are overpriced and stuff, hold Coke still years later and everything. That's a very unusual thing to do, whether it works out well or not. He could think that a stock is overpriced and um, and still hold it through then. And it was just interesting with the way that Fisher thought about those things. Does it seem like the most, I guess, best investors, you know, I guess, historically and currently, they truly don't think about the stock as being like, involved in the stock market. They truly take the stock out of the business and think about it from like a business perspective. And I think that's very hard for a lot of people to do because either you're a portfolio manager and you're having to think about, you know, how do you um, maybe correlate some things, asset allocation, how much cash you have, stuff like that, as opposed to just being a business analyst. And I feel like Fisher, I feel like Buffett, I feel like Munger, they don't think about it from a portfolio manager's perspective. Mm-hmm. And it's more so from like a business owner perspective. Well, yeah, the ones that I just talked about. But that's tough to do for a lot of people, especially if you're in managing money or stuff like that. Because not only are you analyzing this biz- businesses and stuff like that, but you're also having to play this sort of game of like, what's the market going to do and everything like that. I guess. But so he talks a little bit about that, too. Um I think you think you should play that game, but I don't know that that playing that game could help you because the problem that he has, which he explains at one point is let's say that I'm pretty good at, at knowing the market's going to go down or something. Yeah. But he was saying, I think I can be 90% sure that a company is an extraordinary company. Mm -hmm. I can't be sure that the price I'm paying is right and stuff. So you have to then find those very few cases where you're almost sure that it's a great company and yet it's at a normal price or or he would pay a little bit more than a normal price. What price do you think he would pay for like a great business? So, I mean, this is, these are different times, but a lot of times he's only paying 20 times earnings or something. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. uh, unfortunately, they're much better businesses usually than the kinds of businesses people are buying today. And there were much cheaper prices, but it was a different time. Interest rates were different, things like that. Um, but all the, and he wasn't buying Texas Instruments in the point where it got incredibly overvalued either, you know. Um, and he generally wasn't buying IPOs. He did buy Texas Instruments in an offering that was similar to an IPO. But most companies he doesn't seem to be buying as like IPOs. So um, I I think that his point is sort of like, even if I can predict that that's going to happen with the market, Mm. he's saying maybe I'm 60% sure that that will happen. Whereas I feel 90% sure that I'm right about the company in the long run, Mm -hmm. then I shouldn't get out of the company, just be uh, the company stock, just because I know the market's going to go down now, even though you can, you know, sell out and those sorts of things. And and Keynes was the same way. So Keynes as an investor Mm -hmm. thought that he could do that early on and then decided not to do it because it's not worth it. I think that's um, the thing that's common about all of them. In fact, it's common even about Graham. And it's the biggest issue when I talk to people um, is what you're saying, which is that as much as they say all these things that are the Buffett things or whatever things, the one thing that they don't commit 100% to the idea of is the value of your stock has nothing to do with the market price. It can't. If you're trying to take advantage of the market in terms of when to buy and when to sell, your appraisal of the stock has to be your own appraisal. That would be the same whether or not the company was public or private. Mm-hmm. That's the Buffett approach. That's Fisher's approach. That actually is also even Graham's approach. He's People don't think about that, but he's using numbers, price to book, PE, whatever sorts of things, net nets, stuff like that, where he's evaluating it on a basis that does not care what the market thinks about it. He has his interpretation of it. His is quantitative. Fisher's is qualitative. But they're the same sort of thing in which you shouldn't believe that the market in any way represents what the value of your stock is. And you shouldn't care about the quotations unless you're going to buy or sell. And, you know, that's the thing that almost no one I talk to commits 100% to. They read all these things. Do you think that part is harder, managing those expectations in your brain? Not for these people. But I'm saying for investors in general. Is if that harder than actually not understanding? Not that way if they... But is that harder than actually picking out the business itself that's going to succeed? Yeah, the temperament thing is going to determine your returns more than than having to be smart about it. There's plenty of investors who I don't think are the geniuses or anything, but they can be very successful investors just because of that. If 
I mean, there are certain moments in time even where if you don't have to have any real intelligence, if you just um, are willing to completely ignore the market, you could make money. Mm -hmm. Now, those are rarer because you don't have to kind of find them on your own. But there are just things about um, that recurrently happen kind of in bubbles or in busts of things where all you have to do is be willing to buy stuff and ignore the fact that everyone else isn't willing to buy it. Or, you know, if you were someone who shorted and stuff short when when it's clear that it's completely overvalued. I think doing Scottobot helps people with that. At least it's helped me with it. Take the stock out of the business. I think with it, yeah. I've found that people can always do it with a company they work at. Yeah, because they're so, there, they're, their boots on the ground, they're seeing it every single day. They're like, well, things are okay here. Our business isn't 8% worse off today or 10% worse if there's like a drawdown or something like that, yeah. right? I, I've given examples of that before, but people with insiders, people that I talk to always think that insiders at public companies know all this stuff and that's why they're buying and stuff. I've talked sometimes to people who are insiders at public companies and whenever they've told me about buying their own stock, um, it's been, so, I mean, uh, we said we weren't gonna cut di- the dividend. I was there and stuff. I knew we weren't going to cut the dividend. The dividend yield kept going up and up. I didn't know why it was happening in the market. I was there every day. Not a lot was changing. So I thought, I'll just you know, I'll just buy more of the stock and then kept buying and kept buying. Yeah. And there was nothing to it than that, except it's not anything different than the public information that was there about the company. But that would have been true of every other company in their industry. It's just that because they were there, they didn't go, oh, the market must know something I don't know. They just said, I'm the treasurer of the company. I know what's going on here. Mm. Um, so... I don't need to pay attention to what the market's doing. And I think people can do that sometimes in their hometown things. Sometimes people in certain industries can do it where they can see the market's reaction is strange compared to their own. And a lot of times you should take that into account. Um, Even like I've talked about Village Supermarket or something where I worked and and lived in that area and whatever. You know, there were short write-ups that were, you know, negative on the company or short or whatever. Not a lot. It was a well-known company. But those people had never been to any of the stores. And and some of them had never been to that area of the country. So I don't know if that you need to be there to know these things. Yeah. Um, It's definitely an advantage, though. Yeah. What I've learned from going on our research trips Mm -hmm. and seeing the individuals involved and the actual business itself, it's a huge advantage. Right, because I think the thing that's really important that Fisher... Psychologically. Yeah, the thing that's really important that Fisher talks about with Scuttlebutt is he talks about... Now, he did this with, with a technical company, so I don't know that's I'd call it Main Street, but he talks about the difference between the Main Street story and the Wall Street story. Mm-hmm. And most of when I ask people about stocks, or they talk about stocks, what they are giving me is the Wall Street story. Mm-hmm. It's actually consensus built around what people's perceptions of the stock is and the company, but through the approach of how Wall Street thinks about the it. pinstripes. Which can be very different from how it's perceived as a company. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's a technical company or it's not or whatever, how customers and suppliers and things perceive it is often very different than the stock. And those perceptions may not change that much, whereas the stock may. And the stock thing also often feeds back into itself in that after there's been poor performance for a while in the stock, even when there's no justification for that poor performance in the business, the business was it's just it got ahead of itself. It got overpriced. Um, then the story becomes negative stories about the company, whatever things, trying to explain why it hasn't done well as a stock. When many times the reason it hasn't done well as a stock is because it got too expensive before or it's too cheap now or a combination of the two things. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is interesting doing Scuttlebutt, but I've done things like Scuttlebutt and stuff on companies before, e- even big companies and things, and and had different impressions of them. Um, sometimes they're extreme, and you can ask people in the industry about them, and you get a different perception from it. We've talked a little bit on this podcast before about Tandy Leather. I think the perception of Tandy Leather as a stock is incredibly different from the perception if you talk to their customers and their suppliers and stuff. Mm -hmm. one of the most I've ever seen. And I don't think it changed that much. I think the perception in the stock did. Yeah. But it was one of the most remarkable I've ever seen in terms of how customers, uh, wholesale customers and things, how incredibly powerful they thought the company was and how little they liked doing business with them. Um, It really stood out in both ways. The only other company I've ever looked at that had any similarity is Swatch, which has certain things that we that's you know sort of technical or whatever but basically if you buy swiss swiss watches and stuff you're buying certain brands and things that you really like and whatever but much of the guts of the watch are actually made by one company in switzerland that the others all depend on and so there's an attitude about that if you talk to anyone in the swiss watch industry about swatch that is interesting and unusual and a combination of fear that they could put them out of business, but also that they have to work with them, but also whatever. And that sort of thing is also present at Tandy and stuff. 
when I've talked to anyone about stocks and things who doesn't know anything about leather crafting stuff, I get none of that feeling mm -hmm. about with, with, um, Tandy. So and, the experts are saying it's interesting and everybody else that doesn't know anything about the actual business from like an expert perspective, they don't like it. They don't like it now that the stock hasn't done well and stuff. They might have liked it when the stock was doing well. Well, I'm saying I wonder if, it, their, if their judgment is clouded because of the stock price as opposed to actual business itself. Right. That's That could definitely be part of it. And the other thing is not knowing anything about the industry. You don't get a feel for what's going on there. But like that there were problems there about that before. I mean, we had two concerns when I looked at the stock and stuff before that were their relationships with their biggest customers, their wholesale type customers, and their their um, manager situation, if they had enough good managers. Mm -hmm. And it's just when talking to people, that came through all the time, those two points about like, are all their managers really good? And do their big customers who both compete with them and are their customers, do they like them? Do they not like them? What's the situation there? And and it's almost like those two things, if you look at the stock story, are not there at all. Mm -hmm. But if you were to write an article about Tandy for a business thing or whatever, and you looked through um, uh, talking to customers and to people at the company to whatever, like they keep talking about this stuff that just Wall Street, I guess, if you want to call that as a micro cap stock, I don't know that Wall Street cares about it, um, never thinks about. Mm -hmm. Because those aren't things that you would think about as a stock investor. And a lot of that is the Phil Fisher stuff. He's very interested in stuff about the companies that if you were going to buy the entire company, you might care a lot about. Um, but if you were going to <coughs> Wall Street stuff, you would not care about. He does not care about what the earnings will be next year. So he never even looks at like the EPS from a year to year perspective. Like saying he never says it grew 20% year over year or something, which is always what these kinds of things talk about. He always says we need to take a number of years. This cycle will sales and stuff be higher than last cycle. All sorts of things like that. A very Buffett approach. You know, it's, it's interesting to think like you've, I'm sure, met people in your life and I'm sure people listening have met individuals in their life where, you know, they have just this extraordinary net worth and maybe it's in land or something mm -hmm. like that, right? So they their net worth is tied up. Maybe it was passed down or they just own a ton of land. Um, and then a company that we've spoken about a lot so I'm sorry. So let me backtrack. So okay. if you look at an individual, you'd be like, oh, he has a net worth of $100 million. He owns a ton mm -hmm. of land, whatever. But you could look at um, like a company that we don't own, MLP, Maui Land and Pineapple. Um, and you could look at that and say, you know, they have X amount of acres. It's oh, currently yeah. being traded for as if it's worth $200,000 or $300,000. Mm -hmm. If you talk to anybody that lives in the area, uh, they'll say, you know, I don't know if a single acre could go for less than $700,000. Mm -hmm. You know, and then they sell parcels of land or whatever that is even north of that. But it's just interesting how the perspective is totally different based on, well, it's actually trading the market as if it's $200,000. But if I own the whole company myself, I'd be saying, hey, I got a net worth of a billion dollars because I yes. have all this land, you know? Yeah. So it's like the perception thing is different. Absolutely. And that one's even, that one's shocking in that case, because if you go back and look at what Maui Land and Pineapple was trading at at a time when I would say the there was a time when the stock value was at a high point for the stock. I th it's, So if you look, I think a high point for the stock price did not match up at all with a high point for the land price. And then a low point for the stock price did not match up with a low point for the land price um, for a short period it did. But I mean, if you go back a decade or so, so you more than a decade now. So you can go back to a period where I think my valuation would be that there was actually a premium into the stock that people were actually willing to pay more for the stock, mm -hmm. uh, more for the land, owning it through a stock than if they own the acreage themselves. Yeah. And then you have it completely changed that way. But that that's also one why I think you can't ever blame management for the stock price directly. And this is one where I kind of disagree or whatever with some value investors that value investors often not always, but often. What they really want is a catalyst and how is it going to get realized now? I would say pretty often. Yeah. Pretty so always. So when we talk about <laughs> that, even with companies, one of the things that we want to point out either when we talk to management or when we're analyzing company or whatever is like, we're not actually looking for you to sell the company right now. I mean, that's not really the kind of investor that we are and whatever. And so... And that's a hard thing to do or whatever. But we were talking to, we talked to a couple of bank things. And they're for small banks. And small banks sell out to bigger banks all the time at much at very high prices. They get very good prices for themselves. There's some synergies and stuff, but the shareholders who sell out get the real benefit from it usually. And um, I think that a lot of investors I talked to them are like, why haven't you sold the bank yet? <laughs> but it, you're getting higher returns at that bank than the bigger bank that it would buy you. I don't want to own part of the bigger bank and I don't want to get paid in cash for this right now. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather be invested in the bank that's growing money over time. So I don't want you to sell out. Mm -hmm. And 
things like Madeline and Pineapple, are there things that we would care about there that they're not doing the best? Yes. Of course. And that's the thing. Like, what are they going to do to monetize this land? How are they going to get right. the return? But, I get that. But what I would be calculating is the appraisal value of where the land is. And like, then are they issuing stock? Are they raising debt? Are they doing the best things to develop it? Whatever sorts of stuff. And not what have you done that to drive up the stock price? Because mm -hmm. if the stock price triples, they didn't do that. And the stock price declines in half. They didn't do that either. The, but if they sold land at a dumb price, they did do that. If they borrowed money when they shouldn't have and you know don't have stuff to pay for it, then they shouldn't have done that either. And so there are things with companies that I don't like some of the deals they do and stuff. And they should be blamed for those, but they shouldn't have to, you know, be based on what the stock price has worked for them. Yeah. And maybe it comes with just managing money for others. There's been a couple of times where we've said, look, if this was uh, Gannon and Kooning company and hundred percent of our own money, mm -hmm. would we make this decision? Yeah. So, I mean, if, or if this, this stock price has fallen, would we be concerned about it? No. Right. Yeah, so it gets tougher, you know? Yeah. And Buffett's big thing. That's the difference between him and everyone else is that he does not in any way think of a stock as different from buying an entire company. Mm -hmm. He never makes that calculation at all. So all he does is figure out whether he would want to buy the whole business. And if he does, then he'll buy the stock for less than you would get the business. And that's the huge Mr. Market advantage that we're talking about with Graham is that's really how Graham thought about it. And he taught Buffett that approach really uh, that you do not use the market in any way as a signal for what the value of the stock is. Mm -hmm. And it is true that it's probably easier, and Buffett got to know this because he had bought entire businesses and stuff. If you're in the habit of buying entire businesses. Or large stakes. Large stakes, illiquid positions and things, things where you have a uh, involvement in the day-to-day -day of the business or whatever, or you just have any experience where you're a private business operator or had a history where you were a lot of times those people I think have a big advantage over people in stocks. That's the thing that surprises me about stock stuff sometimes is um, in a sense, someone could have a business and be able to sleep at night because they're not getting a quote on that business and they know everything about it, you mm -hmm. know, and then you, they sell that out, you know, they retire eventually they sell their business and they put into stocks and yet the quote bothers them. Mm -hmm. So and now I'm, I disagree with a lot. You know how like they say like the value gene, it either you get it right away or you don't get it right, right. away. I think everybody, generally speaking, they understand you, when you're investing, you're laying out capital today because you think it's cheap or something like that, right? right. You're laying out a dollar because you think it, you're going to turn into a dollar twenty, a dollar fifty. I don't think that is the gene thing that um, either it grabs you right away or it doesn't. Okay. From speaking to so many individuals, I think the gene thing, and maybe this is something that can be taught, but even people know this and they just can't let their emotions, they let their emotions get to them. It's truly the thinking about stock as a business and taking the stock out of it and right. understanding that it is a business. Like I said, everyone understands that investing is, you know, paying a price today to hopefully make more money in the future, right? Okay. No one's going to buy a dollar for a dollar fifty, generally speaking, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yes, no one's going to do that. They may be wrong about their assessment, right. but no one's going into it with that perspective. Mm -hmm. The total gene thing, I think is truly thinking about it as a business. It's when you look at a 10K, when you look at the accounting, it's, well, let's actually break this down. Do they have operating leverage? And you could see that this happened, mm -hmm. or let's talk about their subscribers here, and this is blah, 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 whatever. It's right. really breaking down the business and thinking about it from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. And people, I feel like that's tough for a lot of individuals. And that's why I'm always talking about, okay, yes, we're you know, you may be a portfolio manager, but I don't think about you as being a portfolio manager. I think about what we mm -hmm. do is really a private, a business that invests in businesses, just right. as if we were to invest in the lemonade stand down the corner, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's it's hard to do maybe with, you know, everything going on in the market and blah, blah, blah. I mean, because you may underperform for a little bit sometimes, you, but that has nothing right. to do with the actual, you know, operations of the business. And I think for me and growing as an investor, what helped me kind of think differently about that is again, doing scuttlebutt, doing research, talking to people, maybe closer to the situation or maybe talking to management or just seeing it for yourself, seeing the customers there saying, wait, this is not just a quote. This is a mm -hmm. real business. This is something that is very important in the community. This is something that they have employees and assets and blah, 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 mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and Graham has a thing at the end of The Intelligent Investor. He doesn't name it, but it's Geico is the company he's talking about. And he says that the one <clears throat> thing he'd like to leave you with is that here, what I've laid out, the strategies and stuff that we used, and they made like 20% a year doing it and stuff, um, would, through a lot of work and effort in doing this and applying this technique all the time, we were able to have a record that was better than most of Wall Street and with lower volatility and whatever. And most of our fortune has been made by a single deal that we did that some people came in and we had particularly high 
belief in the business model that it had and stuff. We bought it and we never, never sold it. And Geico actually did even better um, than all of Graham's other investments and stuff. Now mm -hmm. he had to distribute it because it couldn't be too big a share of his um, uh, business. So he had to distribute it to people. But as long as they kept it, which he did, um, you would have done very well in that. But it's his. he didn't follow his usual procedures, which is that even though the stock got ahead of itself, sometimes he wouldn't sell it mm -hmm. because he said he had a particular, felt a particular connection for it. He was actually the chairman of the board for a while. Um, so... You have a certain different like approach to a business type thing, and he may have had that also for his control type investments too. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the average person has difficulty in thinking about their stocks as stocks as being different from owning a business. Whereas like the Mister Market thing we're talking about and the Phil Fisher thing and stuff is, it only should give you the benefit of buying or selling. You never have to. You can always pretend that a stock you own is not marketable. And so you should never be harmed by the fact that it is marketable. That should never be a It should be a benefit, right? Yeah. You should, you know, it shouldn't be like if you were okay, if you were a venture capital investment in, in Texas Instruments, you should not feel better than if the company went public and then mm -hmm. you have to see those negative things, you know? Like if you're, you know, whatever it is, Uber or Lyft or whatever, there may have been people who owned it before and were, were not bothered by it because yeah. no one was quoting them on mm -hmm. it. The last round that they did or whatever was fine. And so they don't have to see every day. But then once it's in the marketplace, then they're, that's a different kind of investing they feel like, even it, though it's the same. It's just different. So I've talked about it a few times on the podcast. My grandpa owns a steel company in mm -hmm. Illinois. And it's a, I mean, I guess it's a small business. I mean, they may do like 40 million in revenue or whatever, but whatever you want to call that, I don't mm -hmm. know what that is. But they, for example, he was not worried. I, I could promise you mm -hmm. that when this whole COVID shutdown happened, there was not one point that, or one thought that went through his mind of, I wonder what the market value of my company is right now. Right. <laughs> it's really, okay, how do we, you know, use this government assistance to do this mm -hmm. and, and keep our employees safe? And how are we going to get through this and stay solvent? Yeah. And how are we going to, you know, turn the production back on or whatever, you know? So it's just interesting, the difference in perspectives that yeah. you get. And to your point earlier of just because your company, you have a market value, you shouldn't think about that as a disadvantage. And a lot of people right. do treat it as a disadvantage when really it should be an advantage. Yeah, absolutely. There's no reason to think that it, you know, that you don't have to take it that way. You can always think of it as if it's a private business. And Phil Fisher basically did because he would hold them for a really long time. I mean, he let price not interfere at all once he owned it basically, if he still thought they had great prospects ahead for him. So like in his time, there's more inflation and stuff. But it basically, if he thought this company could keep growing at like 20% a year, and he had faith in the management and stuff, it was more qualitative. So it was that sort of thing. If he had beliefs in that, then he just kept holding it. Because he figured eventually growing at 20% a year or whatever, that will mean that this will, company will double a couple times every, um, uh, quite a few more than a couple times every few decade or so. And based on that, it will make up for the fact that it's overpriced at this moment. So I won't sell it. You know, I wonder if it's just the benchmark that people, because everyone's always yes, constantly comparing themselves to the SP five hundred. Any attention to the benchmark? I, maybe that's it. That. Maybe I that's think it is I the benchmark. I've said a lot of times that people should ignore it completely because when we talk about things like luck and all those sort of things, that complicates it because the odds that a let's not get too technical about this, but the odds that a strategy that is superior and will be superior on average throughout all periods we could consider in the future. Uh, will underperform the market over fairly long periods of time is much higher than you might think. So uh, a strategy that will outperform the market over 100 years will have a very decent chance of underperforming over 10 years. And yet no one ever says it underperformed under 10 years because value is out of favor. There, it was bad luck. No one says about Buffett like for net, right now, even though the best explanation of Buffett, of Berkshire's underperformance, I would say is um, – that you have factors of a lot of assets, you have factors of luck, you have factors of whether value or growth is in favor. Those explain really much more so than stock picking abilities in one decade or another. Mm -hmm. You know, and in the fifties or whatever, how did he outperform so much? Is it that his skill declined so much from the fifties to the seventies? Well, value performed really well in the fifties and stuff. He was dealing with very little assets, and maybe he was a little bit lucky in the fifties and a little bit unlucky now. But luck is not as big a factor as people make uh, as um, luck is a bigger factor than many people would consider that way in terms of luck, like what outperforms and what doesn't in a period. So there's there's it's, I mean, unless you're doing weird strategies that you're leveraging up arbitrage and stuff like that, you will not consistently outperform. So if, if you're looking for consistent outperformers, that won't happen. But if you're looking for someone to consistently apply a strategy that on average will beat others out. They will do that, but they'll not only be three-year periods, there will occasionally be 10-year periods where they underperform the market. But by the way, underperforming the market in a 10-year bull market, it doesn't hurt you in absolute terms very much at all. Just hurts you in your 
I mean, as long as your capital base is But still you, there. only because you know what the benchmark was. Well, if, yeah. Just like we're saying, you don't need to pay yeah, attention I mean, to the quote. If you can yeah. ignore the benchmark, you're going to retire fine. Yeah, sure. So it's really focusing on absolute returns. I think so, yeah. Mm. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself on today's podcast, the number one value investing podcast in the world. If you're listening on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up. If you're listening on the podcast side, things a rating and review goes a very long way. If you do sign up for quickfs.net in the uh, show notes, you will see a link. If you sign up through the link, Jeff and I get a commission every time you pay your monthly price. It helps support everything that we are doing. Uh, I want to thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you in the next podcast.